Good morning, everyone. Wow, I'm, I'm very powerful this morning, vocally. Um, looks like there was a bit of, a, of an exodus after the last popular talk, so I will try not to take that personally. It just means that everybody who's here really intends to be here, right? Unless you fell asleep and then would just woke up at the end. But that's fine, too. This is the Apple talk. <laughs> no, this is this is an ask me anything that I think that uh, Mike McGrath was going to give. No, anyway, anyway. So, this is I'm here to talk about uh, Linux in cars. Uh, the CentOS Automotive Sig is where this work is happening from Red Hat, and so um, this will just kind of hit some of the highlights about that. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about why automotive. For everybody who knows doesn't know, I'm Jeffro. I work at uh, Red Hat in the Open Source Program Office in the office of the CTO. And automotive is. It's not in presentation mode. It was a minute ago. Go. There we go. Sorry. Thank you. There's a twister down at the end. I think. Anyway, not not important. Um, honestly, this microphone is going to do well for all of us. It's from. Probably from this being turned up so loud. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the automotive industry and why it is in the process of transitioning to this new fangled thing called software-defined vehicles and connected cars, rather than the uh, continuing with the current state of the art, which is mostly made up of a series of embedded systems loosely connected. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how the automotive SIG started within CentOS and what its motivations were, uh, how it's going what it provides, what we're up to recently, and then uh, where it's headed, which is mostly in working with external communities in automotive, um, which is, uh, happens to be very exciting and it's a, a highly varied uh, environment. So first of all, why automotive? The automotive industry is in, enduring a transition right now, like many industries, to move towards um, software-defined uh, artifacts, which in, in loose mean, in loose, it, to kind of understand it, you need to understand how cars are built currently. Right now, cars are similar to the picture on the left, where um, the car is essentially a series of embedded systems in, embedded in black boxes. Uh, they're called ECUs, in embedded or, uh, electronic control units. Um, the terminology obviously comes from the 1980s when electronics were first being built into cars. That is, uh, incidentally, also where the uh, ISO standard for functional safety was originally, originally came from in the 1980s. Um, so that's a short way of saying the functional safety specifications are for, that we need to comply with for these cars uh, do not really cover large, complex software operating systems like Linux. Uh, right now, the, the most that they really accommodate are real-time operating systems. Um, but uh, the industry has seen, honestly, what Tesla has done. They have seen what a lot of uh, other industries have done in transitioning to software-defined uh, whatever, and uh, they, they believe that they, that can be a, really, a real boon for the automotive industry. Uh, this is coming from all corners of the automotive industry as well, not just OEMs who you know, tend to, to be uh, very forward-thinking but also very traditional in their manufacturing processes. This is also very much coming from the suppliers. Uh, suppliers, uh, there are not that many large-scale suppliers in the, in the market, uh, but you can think of companies like Denso and Capgemini and, uh, and uh, Bosch, who are all very much interested in this and very particularly interested in open source. Most of these companies have never worked in open source before. They will have individual developers who have used open source or contributed, but as, a, as companies, they really haven't in the past. Um, the other really interesting aspect of this is the connected car, which is essentially treating the vehicle as an edge device. And you can see how these two concepts really play off of each other, that when you have software-defined uh, artifacts and a large-scale compute unit inside the car that is dividing up workloads into containers rather than by individual ECUs, that uh, you're really enabling a large amount of communication that never existed before from the car or within the car. And so um, there's an opportunity here for these edge devices to provide microservices for cars, 
to, um, to improve on the services that exist. I mean, we all have experience with this using Android Auto or, or CarPlay, where you have a map in the car, and when you get a, a text, it flashes up on your screen. Do you want me to read this text out loud to you? There's a number of services going on there. So that, that's where, uh, that, that's the, dr the dream of the automotive industry that they are trying to bring into reality. Um, there has been an industry, the industry response to this has really been to uh, look very much more seriously at open source than they have done in the past. Um, there's a lot of fear and uncertainty and doubt about open source in this and in many traditional industries. And so um, I'm very pleased to see the, the number of, uh, of communities that are popping up that uh, can really help people out with that. And it has really helped change the attitudes of a number of different very large companies. Um, I've, just in the last year, I know that, um, that uh, Volvo and Ford have both started open source program offices within their companies. And, and they're very interested in understanding what it means to contribute to open source. And uh, so we're hoping to push that along. So um, in our response to this from Red Hat was to uh, launch a CentOS Automotive Special Interest Group to essentially create a, an operating system that would be appropriate for these cars. Um, Red Hat, of course, doesn't do this just because it's interesting. We also do it because uh, Red Hat is in the process of developing an in-vehicle OS that is based on Linux and is functionally safe. Um, as I mentioned before, the safety, uh, the, the, uh, the safety specifications are very complex and take a long time to do, so we are still in the functional safety process. But that is certainly the intent. And um, being Red Hat, of course, we are doing all of this development in the open within CentOS. And so you can literally go to the CentOS Automotive SIG and take a look now at this automotive stream distribution, which is the direct upstream to, uh, to what will become the, uh, the in-vehicle OS. The uh, SIG has also produced other artifacts. Uh, one of the most interesting is uh, Eclipse Blue Chi. It's a project that we contributed to the Eclipse Foundation last year. It is a, um, you can, can think of it as a very lightweight uh, container orchestrator. It really is simply an extension of system D. Um, so uh, I'm gonna probably not be the right person to go th into the heavy details on that, but I do have links in this deck that, uh, that you can go to to find out f from the people who built it. And of course, feel free to come to the SIG meetings because we have those every month. Uh, you can see from the diagram that uh, this is essentially how we are planning to, to do this in terms of uh, the relationship between the CentOS stream and uh, the in-vehicle OS, eventually over there on the bottom right. Um, the, uh, the SIG and uh, the uh, automotive stream distribution do use CentOS stream artifacts for the most part. There are a few custom artifacts such as the kernel because we need to do things like turn on real time and, um, and uh, do some, some optimizations. And there's also a significant new hardware support that is being developed within the SIG that uh, doesn't exist in RHEL. Because there's, uh, there's hardware for automotive that doesn't really, isn't really applicable, applicable to RHEL. But it is to, to uh, the in-vehicle OS. So uh, this is a contribution model. This, I had this uh, slide up when I gave this presentation at Red Hat Summit, and I think that the people in this room are probably fairly familiar with contribution models related to CentOS. I'm guessing, you know, a little show of hands. And um, so I won't, won't spend too much time here. Uh, just want to say that we do actually have quite a lot of activity going on in upstream communities directly from the automotive SIG, and that is largely due to one of my co-workers named Leo Rossetti whom you will run into if you come and visit us in the SIG. He does a lot of work in these upstream communities. So what does the automotive stream distribution provide? You can see that it has a kernel, a, a container runtime. Um, we do provide uh, OTA and security updates. Or not, I wouldn't say that we provide OTA. We provide the uh, basis for OTA. Uh, this, the AutoSD is not... Um, has not settled on one particular OTA because every, every manufacturer has expressed interest in a different one. And so it's not something that, that we're going to dictate to the market. Uh, you can see uh, the colors actually indicate which of these items uh, have a, an interest or a, a dependency on functional safety and that, that ISO 26262 certification, uh, which is obviously a large portion of it. 
uh, failure detection and control. Um, mixed criticality is a really difficult one, and that's being discussed in a number of these communities, both open source and closed. Uh, that's taking, that means that uh, for within a given system, each, each um, the container might, or, or VM, if it's set up with VMs, might have its own, might have its own, be its own uh, little safety island. So one might be uh, ASIL QM, which is essentially no functional safety required. Uh, another one might be ASIL B, uh, which is fairly, the way that I've, I've understood the ASIL system is that ASIL QM means none. ASIL A means that if something breaks, you're annoyed. ASIL B means if something breaks, the car might not work again. And it goes all the way up to ASIL D, which means if it breaks, then um, uh, people get hurt. And uh, so right now we are, uh, have aspirations towards ASIL B, Bravo, which means that it uh, keeps the car running, but it, hopefully nothing, nobody will get hurt by it. Um, and there are a lot, obviously a lot of, of other constraints here, like there's a, for ASIL-B workloads like the rear view camera, there is a requirement that uh, the machine be operable within two seconds of hitting the start button, which as you can imagine is a little bit difficult sometimes to boot Linux under, under two seconds. Um, we have managed to do it. it is, uh, it's not impossible, it's just uh, another technical challenge. So this is a slide about Blue Chi. Uh, you can kind of see that it is essentially a lightweight container orchestration system. Uh, it is being developed in Eclipse now, so it is completely in the, in the public. And um, as I said, there's a, a number of, a, there's a presentation and a great video um, from EclipseCon last year that goes over, over Blue Chi in detail. Keep an eye on the time here too. Oh, this is the, just the community artifacts for the CentOS SIG. Um, I think that everybody in this room probably knows how to find community artifacts related to CentOS. So in the interest of time, I'm going to press on. So the interesting things going on right now in the SIG, and this is coming from the meeting we just had yesterday, we have a monthly meeting on the first Wednesday of each month. Um, the, uh, we are working with uh, Sophie and the SDV Alliance, which are uh, open source initiatives related to the development of software-defined vehicles, working towards shared demos uh, to be delivered at CES. Uh, we did this last year. The SDV Alliance had two different demonstrators, one of which uh, did feature uh, AutoSD and BlueChi, and hopefully we'll have uh, more than that in the, in the next round. Uh, we, there are containerized versions of a number of the Eclipse SDV projects. We haven't talked about Eclipse SDV yet. Eclipse SDV is an umbrella project within the Eclipse Foundation that provides on the order of two dozen software projects in the service of SDV development. And uh, being the Eclipse project, it's or the Eclipse Foundation. It's very code forward, it's extremely open. They have uh, very strict li uh, licensing requirements to make sure that everything is truly open and, and not just partly. Uh, we do have uh, some interesting hardware support being developed within the SIG. Uh, one that has actually launched and is available is for the TI AM69. This is a brand new board from TI that is uh, targeting the automotive industry. Um, and automotive boards tend to be a little different from your average development board, and they're certainly very different from servers in the way that we normally think of them at, at Red Hat. So uh, having support by this that was actually contributed by TI, and they did all that work within the, the SIG, um, bringing questions to every meeting every month, and uh, it was actually a really good community effort, and we definitely want to repeat that with some of the other organizations that are in the process of doing this. Um, we uh, have enabled some automotive packages to be included in ELN at the same time they're updated in Fedora Rawhide. We want, we want all the artifacts that we develop in the SIG to be a part of the community. Uh, we started on migration to CentOS Stream 10. Uh, this has been very exciting for those developing hardware, particularly hardware that didn't exist in the 514 timeframe. And so um, the uh, the hardware manufacturers are then not income, they don't have to backport things to 514, they can just work on, a, on the current kernel. I believe it's 610 is what we're, what we're targeting right now. Thank you, Pat. <laughs> and then um, we just yesterday we did have a, a CI operator demonstration. 
uh, that was on video that will be posted as soon as I am done flocking and get my hands on uh, updating the documentation on CentOS. So lots of stuff going on in the SIG. Um, but I think the most important thing is the work that we do with these external communities. So Eclipse SDV is, as I said, this project that it was started about two years ago as an initiative, an umbrella initiative within the Eclipse Foundation. Uh, there are about 60 companies involved, including some OEMs. Uh, GM has joined and actually has donated an entire project, and they've been um, uh, evangelizing it within the Eclipse community. Um, it's been a very, a very exciting thing. The S Eclipse SDV has a number of events every year. There's a hackathon. Thank you. There's a hackathon going on in November in, I want to say, Karlsruhe in Germany. It's somewhere in, the, in southern Germany. Uh, and I don't think it's actually been announced yet, but th that's when it's going to happen is uh, sometime in mid-November. Uh, there will also be um, a big... Uh, a, a, they're going to be spon they're sponsors of uh, the Open Code Experience which is the big Eclipse event in the fall. And that, I think, is in October in Munich. Um, the nice thing about Eclipse SDV also is that it is staffed by Eclipse Foundation folks who are just top-notch. They actually have a deep understanding of open source and a deep understanding of how companies can participate and contribute in open source products, projects, even when it's difficult for them to do so. And they, have, uh, and they have folks who are dedicated to, to helping companies do that. Can't say enough good things about Eclipse SDV. Uh, one of the other ones that's very interesting that we participate in is called SOFI. It stands for Scalable Open Architecture for Embedded Edge. Uh, SOFI is a bit older. It started within ARM uh, about five years ago, four and a half years ago, and uh, was made into a public um, a public uh, initiative, a SIG, I guess, in, uh, in 2021, if I'm getting my numbers correct. Might be, tw no, I'm, I might, be, might be 2022. In any case, uh, this is, it, it's, it's completely free to join, for any company to join, um, because it is being completely funded by ARM. It is a, an effort within ARM to essentially build out what they've done with System Ready IR into an architecture specific to uh, software defined vehicles with future aspirations to expand this to other embedded edge use cases. Um, I will say that SOFI has been a little bit slow. Um, my feeling is that the value of SOFI has always been in the, uh, the architectural discussions. Um, but a lot of the effort around SOFI has actually been in developing uh, uh, software. Um, Demonstra demonstrable software that implements these, these ideas. So um, the software project is called eWall, for whatever reason. I don't remember what E-W-A-O-L stands for. It is essentially a, um, a Yocto project um, set of source with a build system and a number of layers. Um, one thing that Sophie has done that's been really valuable is the concept of blueprints, which is, our, is essentially a, uh, a written down developed use case that, uh, that could be implemented. So they implement these blueprints. The first blueprint to be, to be brought in as an example is uh, the AutoWare Open AD Kit. AutoWare is an open source organization, which I think we talk about next. AutoWare is an open source uh, foundation based in Japan that uses ROS to provide um, uh, autonomous driving software. This is actually a complete suite. Um, Leo in, on our team has, uh, has actually containerized this, so you can go take a look at it within the uh, CentOS Automotive SIG and download a container that runs the AutoWare Open AD Kit. Um, they have had very strong participation in SOFI as soon as SOFI opened up to the outside world. And, um, and uh, we have joined AutoWare as well in order to do this development around containers and uh, to have an autonomous driving kit example has been extremely useful. So, uh, let's see, just moving on. These are the, um, the communities within the automotive sphere that we currently participate in. Uh, you'll notice that, um, well, of course, CentOS is at the top, of course, but you'll notice that uh, one of them on the right there is called the SDV Alliance. That's not actually a, a, a formal organization. 
it is an informal collection of, uh, of folks from the other organizations, particularly Eclipse SDV, SOFI, COVISA, which is a, uh, it used to be called Genevi. It was a, it's an organization that maintains a vehicle signal specification. And AutoSAR, and AutoSAR is kind of the dark horse among that group uh, because they are not an open project. They are a standards body that is extremely proprietary, although they have expressed an interest in opening up because they have seen the industry response to all of this. Five minutes? Okay. We're just about set here. Um, so you can see we do a lot of participation out in the world. Um, we, are, uh, we hold the, boards, the board chairship for ELISA, a project within the Linux Foundation that is focused on, open, or on uh, functional safety and, and uh, enabling functional safety within the Linux kernel community. Uh, we work with the, ISO, with the International Standards Organization, with ISO, as uh, ISO 26262 goes through a, uh, an updated version. Yes? I don't know if you have a mic, but... Um, Do we have a mic? I was going to ask, because you touch on Elisa, but um, do you have any contributions from the automotive grade Linux uh, group at the Linux Foundation? Because I know Red Hat is a member of that group as well. That's a good question. Uh, we have been members of AGL for a few, day, for a few years now. Uh, AGL has not really been a participant in most of these groups. And we don't currently use any AGL artifacts for, because we're developing our own. Um, AGL is very embedded focused and they have a, uh, a, a strong interest in remaining that way and, and being a Linux that can be used in the development of ECUs. Um, lately the, uh, the member organizations within AGL have been kind of pushing towards more SDV, uh, you know, in-vehicle Ethernet for example. There's an in-vehicle Ethernet working group and so um, I have known the, the AGL folks since AGL started and even long before. So I'm, uh, I would be very interested in continuing discussions with them. So, yes, right behind you, Sean. So with all of this, you know, uh, background being open source, is that gonna give any freedom to the end users whatsoever as far as doing things like avoiding telemetry in their cars because personally I'm not interested in my car maker getting information on exactly how I drive and GPS coordinates of everywhere I go and everyone I associate with. That's a really good question and questions of personal security, data sovereignty, who owns the data that gets generated by the car because cars can generate terabytes of data every day is a really good open question. Um, there is nothing about what we are doing in the CentOS Automotive SIG or within the Red Hat in-vehicle operating system that will either enable or preclude that. We're gonna, we're, what we're building is essentially the operating system plumbing that will run all of these workloads. What those workloads do and what they do with that telemetry is gonna be up to the automaker. Um, not if they want it to remain part of the functional safety certification that we're going to be providing. That's been the main issue with things. I mean, I'm a huge fan of right to repair myself, and I would love to be able to turn off telemetry, but I also do not want to brick my car. <laughs> Besides the fact that it's expensive, it can be a little dangerous. Yeah, turning off telemetry shouldn't break your car. It, it shouldn't, you know, I, and I totally agree. I mean, it would be a great thing that we could do to lobby the OEMs for this. I love it, starting an uprising at, at Fedora Flock. Yes. So can you talk a little bit more about um, how you're going to handle the divergence in timelines for stuff like updates with the auto OS as opposed to like standard RHEL? Because I'm assuming you need a much longer life cycle for the auto OS, right? Because that's potentially mm -hmm. on the road for a decade plus. So how are you, what's the plan around that? Uh, it really depends on the contracts that end up being written with the uh, whoever's buying the software or buying the the uh, the, uh, uh, the contract to the software. I know that we've been talking about basically doing an LTS of, with at least ten years of support, but the idea is to do it for the lifetime of the car, and that's going to be a huge challenge that we'll have to work out. That, that's more of a business question, I think, than a technical question. The business question is how are we going to be able to afford to continue to do backports beyond the standard. Yes, Mike. Yeah. And I just added that one thing's different here is that this is a separate product from Rome. 
Yes. But, but are those updates and stuff going to be contributed back into like the open, the open stuff, the open? Be contributed back upstream. Yes. That, I mean that that's so a, that's a. We have an oil maker that signs a deal for you know twenty years of updates or whatever it is, but all that stuff would end up coming back somewhere in the tree at whatever point it's released, right? That is the way that Red Hat's DNA works: is to continue to contribute those things back whenever we can. Say it's crazy because if you look at Toyota's vehicle lifetimes here in the U.S., I drove a '99 Tacoma to the airport. <laughs> there you go. So I mean, there's a huge mismatch between like the Linux development velocity, like the kernel. I mean, there's some open source projects that just never change, right? Right. Uh, but like the Linux kernel development velocity is like in 25 years. I mean, just think what you were running 25 years ago. Yeah. And what you would do if there were a security exploit on a you know uh, a 46 today, right? One of the things that has been discussed, and this is not part of CentOS and not certainly not part of the Red Hat in vehicle OS, I know we're just about done, um, is uh, the possibility of creating more of an upgrade path. So if an OEM wants to go beyond their contracted 10, 12 years or whatever, that Red Hat could then create a product line around that and say, yes, we will, we will, we will either update the hardware that you've got or we will... Uh, or, sorry, update the software on the hardware that you've got, or we can enable you to upgrade the hardware. I mean, if, if this is all in one SDV, one system, it might be possible to simply upgrade all the hardware at some point and keep the car running. You know, maybe that's a way to, um, to start to do some DIY stuff as well. You know, but of course, you didn't hear that from me, and I'm not, I'm not going to be responsible for anything anybody does to brick their car. So, it, it's like rebooting it to the <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Uh, we are at time, yes. so thank, thank you very you. much, Jeff. You bet. Thanks, everybody.